I define what success looks like for me. And I think at the start of my career, I was a bit you know, worried about what will this move look like or what does this mean? Whereas I don't think about that now. I think about what does success look like for my, for my family, for my health and for the work that I want to do. And that might mean even now as I'm choosing what's next, that might look like something completely different that I haven't done before or that doesn't look like a linear move to, to the next. And so just owning your definition of success and understanding you know, the values that often informed by your values, what that success looks like and what it would take to get there. G'day and welcome to the Global Horizons podcast. I'm Rob Malicki and today's guest on the show is Rebecca Hall, who for many in the industry needs no introduction. She's got a wealth of experience across both government and institutions, higher education, vet sector, you name it, across multiple states and organisations. And in this conversation, we get into lots of interesting topics, including talking a lot about transitions and the sorts of things that you might think about when you're in the middle of a career transition. We also talk about Rebecca's entry point into international education. That's a cracking story, in my opinion, because in some ways, she shouldn't be in this industry at all. If you look at her background, it's surprising that she's ended up just doing so much and ending up in the places where she's ended up, which also goes to part of Rebecca's like no fear philosophy and her curiosity and desire and hunger to keep learning. And we dive into detail on all of those different things. She's had a heap of experience developing policy at different levels of government. And so if you've got had never had any experience thinking about government policy and the impact that it has on our work as international educators, you're really going to learn some great stuff in this conversation, along with hearing some awesome stories because Rebecca is a great storyteller as well. So without further ado, enjoy this conversation with Rebecca Hall. Rebecca, thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Hey Rob, great to be with you. Now, You've got a fascinating story about how you ended up in international education because in some ways, you know, if you look at like your, 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 your upbringing to some extent, you shouldn't have ended up in international at all. No. Well, yes, I did grow up on a, grow up on a farm actually. So you could say, I, and now I live in the city and love the city. So you could say actually I was never where I was meant to be growing up. And I did international business relations at Griffith University and after that, had a real hunger to, to go somewhere. And I didn't really care where it was. I was conscious that I had lived quite a, let's say, a sheltered life out on, out on the farm. And I really wanted to see the world. So I ended up in Japan on the Japan Exchange Teaching Program. And to say I was underprepared would be an understatement. I literally, I didn't have a passport until, sorry, I had a passport the year before because I did go on a mobility program as a university student to Malaysia, but that was the first time I'd been overseas and that was for, I think, two weeks. Uh, So I was about to embark on a journey of possibly being away for three years and I hadn't even turned 21 yet. So we had my 21st birthday, I think the year before I turned 21, before I left, so that was good. I'm about to do the same for my 50th, actually. I'm going to have it a year before because I don't want to wait. But I ended up in Japan and had an amazing time there. And I think this kind of tells the story of why I've lent into government in my roles in international education because it was a government program. And whilst I was there as a teacher, I very much felt that I was there as a learner. Like it felt like a an additional education for me. We were uh, placed in, in Japanese high schools and all we had to have had was graduate from a degree. It didn't matter what it was. So most people weren't teachers. Uh, most people had come from a variety of backgrounds and that certainly sparked my my interest. And I haven't counted how many countries I've been to, but Asia has certainly been my area and my sphere of influence and where I've spent a lot of my time. And I can add a final hook to that. One of the reasons why I stayed close to Australia was after coming back from Japan, I became a mum very early on. So I was 24 when I had Emmy and she's 25 now herself. So for someone to try and have an international career when you have your young mum, that was going to be a challenge as well, but I didn't let that stop me. 
and I found my way into roles in government and institutions and as I say normally stayed close to home so I could either do a week trip and you know call on mum and and friends to to help out with with my daughter and the rest is history. I'm super keen to dig into that like early part of your career but before I do because it's it's such a stretch you know having just traveled all across regional Australia during during the COVID pandemic it's such a stretch to imagine going from like country life to Japan but to me like what you were talking about that first step into an international business degree how did you even choose that? Ah yes I think I was drawn to something more. I knew that I lived in a beautiful part of the world. I was fortunate to to grow up in Australia and have opportunities, but I always knew there was more. And part of it, I think, was a sense of kind of social justice as well, of wanting to see the world and understand the world and test myself. So it was definitely a, a test, you know, can I do this? Can I be away from friends and family? Can I create something that in it, certainly in my world I didn't really know anyone who had been in 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 that field my dad was a plumber my mum had gone to teachers college and was running a childcare center so there wasn't any natural role models for me in that and I think to go back to it I don't really think and this is maybe one of the things that helped me but I didn't think very deeply about it I just was like I've got to do something and hey here's this opportunity in Japan now, when I look back on, on some of those opportunities in, in my career, I kind of think maybe I should have stopped and thought a bit more about it, but it, 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 made, for, it made for, I think, lots of opportunities for growth, uh, lots of opportunities for learning as, as well. And I came back, when I came back from Japan and being a new mum, I went back into local government in, in a role with Gold Coast City Council and that was a really pivotal role for me as well because if you think back back then, those of you on the podcast, you know, Gold Coast, Griffith University, Gold Coast was not even a campus of Griffith at the time. It was still a teacher's college. Bond University was just being developed and so my role in local government was actually how do we build an education ecosystem? That to me, even though it was my entry-level role, is still one of my most pivotal roles, I think, because I learned so much and I had no fear. I was just, oh, we should do this. We should pitch this idea to, I don't know, the prime minister or the state minister, whoever it was. I just, and and I was obviously supported to do that as well. Tell me about more about that role. So that whole process of essentially starting with somewhat of a blank canvas, mm-hmm. because for yeah. some people that, that that's, what do you call it? Like immobilizing almost, but clearly you relished that challenge. I did. Well, it certainly didn't fit my views of what local government did. You know, I definitely thought, and as a new mum, I might have thought, oh, this is a government job. I'll work nine to five and I'll do some interesting things. It says economic development. I think my official title was business development officer. And there were a few of us. We covered a few different key industries within Gold Coast. And As you can imagine, Gold Coast's major industries and continues to be a major contributor was tourism. So it was all about diversification. So, yes, for those in international education, I've been talking about diversification for more than 25 years because it was an economic challenge on on the Gold Coast. In terms of what, what was, you know, what really made it possible and what enabled that was we did have a framework. We did have a strategy which set us some goals, and we had really good stakeholders who were invested in the process. So the partnerships we had with, you know, new and emerging universities, with the TAFE, with private providers, with education agents, actually. One of, you know, Australia's biggest, most successful education agents started in an office in Gold Coast in Southport, and and we knew them back then. So it really was a time of innovation, even if we didn't call it that, and you were rewarded for thinking outside the box. It wasn't until I joined state government and federal government, I was like, oh, that's what policy looks like. That's, that's, that's where you've got to get, you know, a bit, a bit tougher in terms of the choices that you, that you make. Certainly at the council level, it felt like we were there as connectors. We, of course, had some funds and some projects, but really our job was advocacy and connection. And I think those two things are what, what I look for in roles now as well where can I advocate and where can I build connections why is it that you have no fear I mean you said you said that early in one of your responses like we are we just had no fear but but clearly you also had no fear in getting like extraordinarily outside your comfort zone 
firstly by going to do an international business degree and then heading off to Japan. Where does the lack of fear come from? I would say probably I wasn't thinking enough actually. So I don't think at the time I thought, oh, this is so courageous. I just thought let's let's do something. One of my mantras is get stuff done. So I think I was like, right, here's the next step. Let's take it. I also think I've come to reframe it around a character strength, which is love of learning. And it actually took me a while to unpack that because, you know, on some levels I'm like, why did I make that choice? Why did I take that road and not the other? And in all of those choices, it's about learning something new and it's about satisfying a curiosity and not being in a permanent a permanent state. If you look at my career, actually, I have probably Gold Coast City Council was one of the longest roles that I that I had, but I don't tell too many people, but I would say I haven't chosen the career. I've chosen a life to look after my family. And most of those changes or those choices were connected to changing schools or moving to a new area or something where I needed to find a better and different balance. Yeah, that explains a lot because as as you've gone through your career, I mean, we've known each other probably for about 15 years, but I've always marveled at how you've moved effortlessly between different levels of government. You've moved from government into institutions. You've moved states. You've moved countries. And I'm like, Wow, like there is just nothing to nothing could stop you, which is which is remarkable and, and a real you know a real credit to you. You're a consultant, you know. I think that's maybe where yeah. we first got to know each other yeah. was when we were both consulting. Yeah, I think in some ways a lot of that came out of I wouldn't want to say desperation, but by you know when I was consulting, I actually had got divorced, and so I decided, hey, there's no point, you know, that wasn't working. Let's do something different. I need to be at home with my kids. So sometimes in the worst of times, have bred the best opportunities where I kind of, I didn't have anything to lose. I needed to, I needed to go in and, and, and try something new or I wanted to try something, something new. Can I just jump in there? What advice would you have for somebody who's stuck? Because clearly like, you know, if you've run into walls, you're just like, oh, well, I'm going over it. I'm going under it. I'm going around it. Yeah. What, what yeah. advice would you have for somebody that might feel stuck? I would say get a good group of advisors around you, whether they're formal or informal. Just just recently I finished a role and I, I created a little group called my TAG, my transition advisory group. So a group of people that, and I think other people call this like your private board of directors or whatever it might be. But, you know, I knew I needed, again, to come home for family and I didn't want to jump into the next role. I, I, I didn't want to just, I didn't want just a job. I wanted some time. So definitely always surrounding yourself with good people. That's, that's a no-brainer, but almost having some structure around that. And then the other key word in that is transition. And I've come to appreciate this a lot as someone who, and even when you travel a lot as in our, in our sector as well, the transitions are really important, you know how you leave, how you arrive, how you make people feel, how you manage transitions in our workforces, you know, changing, running change management processes and having to exit people from an organisation. All of those transitions to me, and I haven't fully thought about this yet, so I'm articulating something on the go, but I really think the transitions are where the magic happens. And we don't focus on that enough because you can look back and just go, oh, there it is. I did that. I did that. I achieved that. But it's what you do in the transitions that hopefully there's that opportunity for learning. But also there's there's often the the painful stuff, but also the really powerful growth stuff as well. That's super interesting. I mean, as you were talking, I, I've never thought about this either, actually. Mm. Maybe it is that moment where you go into transition, suddenly you accept that it's okay to have all of those part, uh, different paths in front of you. Yep. I think for many of us, you know, we reach these p- points in time where we're like, oh, my God, I can't, I can't choose between all of these different things and it's some, something blocks us there. But yeah. if, if you're sort of in a good transition place, you're actually looking at that with some level of excitement yep. and having that, that, that tag, the transition <laughs> advisory <laughs> group. Yeah. Such, a good, such a good idea, isn't it? Because yeah. so often like we, we kind of accumulate – contacts and we accumulate job responsibilities and and maybe we don't you know we're so in the moment we forget to actually cut away the stuff that yeah it's no longer relevant yeah we'll allow ourselves to be free and the final part if I can do it in 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 threes is and I think you and I have done some consulting well in consulting work we've definitely done this but talking about key performance indicators or success and so one of the things that I realized as well is that 
I define what success looks like for me. And I think at the start of my career, I was a bit, you know, worried about what will this move look like or what does this mean? Whereas I don't think about that now. I think about what does success look like for my for my family, for my health and for the work that I want to do. And that might mean even now as I'm choosing what's next, that might look like something completely different that I haven't done before or that doesn't look like a linear move to to the next. And so just owning your definition of success and understanding, you know, the values that often informed by your values, what that success looks like and what it would take to get there. Do you think people in their early career tend to overthink that? Yeah. Yeah. I definitely overthought it. But then I got to that point where I didn't have a choice where I was like, okay, I have to go part-time now. So here's an opportunity. Let's go do that. It wasn't, it wasn't the the choice to, to just wonder. Yeah. I've been ruminating on that recently, just how like, you know, we all know it, particularly once you start getting older and into your middle of your career, you're like, oh, actually, I'm writing this story as I go. It's not just kind of all preordained at at the start. And whilst it is really important to have goals and, you know, things that you might want to achieve, maybe maybe we do overthink it too much when we're young. (laughs) Just like, yeah, I guess we're we're all the centre of our own story, aren't we? Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. If I go back to Japan and me as a university student before that, I was a university student who did not want to put up their hand or have to say something in a tutorial. I would prepare one thing to say, but I would hope that I wouldn't have to contribute. And I wouldn't say I was shy, but I didn't have confidence in uh, in the academic environment. What Japan did for me, and I think what international education, when it's at its best, does for those as learners is opens you up to possibilities that you never thought possible for you. So I'm in Japan speaking in Japanese, a language that I had never formally studied, in front of a 1,000 school students and their parents. I'm singing a song on it. Like these are things that never, ever would have been possible for me. So I think that Japan experience, once I had opened that up. I'm like, I can do anything. I can come back and do a speech in English now. That's a very easy thing to do if I've if I've stood in front of thousands of people and and, and done that. So yeah, I just wanted to to focus on that in terms of you're not a set uh, set way. Let let me take you forward to to a recent role you've had mm. and to the start of the pandemic. You've arrived in Indonesia yep. and all hell is breaking loose. Can you tell me a little bit about the role that you? we're going to, you're going into there and, and, and what happened? Yeah, great question, Rob. And I tried to go to Indonesia. So during pre-COVID, I was working for Austrade. I had my dream job, head of international education for Austrade. Someone who, you know, 25 years earlier, 22 years earlier had started in, in education. And unfortunately, the pandemic hit, certainly Prime Minister's messages at the time, but also some of the government decisions didn't really mean that I was going to be able to put my skills in the way that I wanted to to share them. And at that same time, Victorian government was recruiting for a commissioner for Victoria to Southeast Asia. I'd already worked with Victorian government. I joked that going to Melbourne was my first overseas posting from Brisbane to Melbourne. That was 10 years prior. But I thought, you know, it was it was COVID times, but it was 2020 and we thought that we were going to see the, the worst of it. And I said, great, yes, let's do it. Let's go to Jakarta. So I ended up in Singapore, actually. And the role had three offices and we set up a fourth office during COVID in, in Vietnam. And again, I was so excited to be able to contribute in, in that way. One, because Southeast Asia, and that's where I've spent a lot of my, my career and my time. Two, because it was a broader role than international education, we focused on trade, investment, government-to-government partnerships, innovation and education. But as many know, our relationships with Southeast Asia, education, I know it's corny to say, but it really is the cornerstone to many of our relationships and many of our trade and investment partnerships too because of the strong alumni in, in the region. So... I think I'm still, I, I finished that role in, in July this year, so only a few months ago. And again, one of the best jobs I've ever done. Definitely put myself out of my comfort zone. Of course, came to the role with a lot of experience and we delivered a lot, but also I had to learn a lot because 
the way of engaging internationally or the way of doing our work completely changed. So we had to innovate and find ways of how are we going to get access to these key decision makers that we want to talk to that, you know, won't turn up to a Zoom call or how are we going to promote our products and services when the traditional trade shows or the traditional distribution networks aren't set up. So it was a great chance to to lead and be in the region, uh, but also really fun to innovate and do some some different things and rewrite the playbook really in terms of how we can do trade and investment in the region. And so what sort of things did you try? Well, I went back, well, I tried and true, went back to my education roots. So I did a lot on talent, so conversations around talent development, innovations with the likes of FutureLearn and some of the other platforms in online learning, targeting teachers and decision makers in that space. Went back to two two drinks that I like. I did a fair bit with coffee and a fair bit with wine, actually. So we, particularly with coffee, actually, because people don't realise how important Southeast Asia is to the global coffee production uh, out of mainly Indonesia and also Vietnam. Uh, but also it's a kind of, it became a low risk engagement uh, piece for us, working for Victorian government and Melbourne I believe it's official, claiming the title as the cafe capital of the world, coffee capital of the world. It's a big part of why people love spending time in, in Victoria around the cafes and the coffee. So we use that as, a, as an entry point, actually, and it got us quite a lot of access. It made for some really fun engagement using coffee diplomacy, as we were calling it. When, the, when borders were open and we could do more engagement, we were doing Melbourne brunches, showcasing all of our other great food, but really centering it around coffee. And it was surprising to me how much traction we got from that because it was also something quite unique. Queensland couldn't really come in and say, hey, we're doing coffee as well. So, and we got to meet a lot of people, whether it was virtual coffees or or in person. And also culturally acceptable that I did mention wine as another example. It's a, a big export for, for Australia, but of course, it's not always culturally appropriate to be engaging, you know, through through alcohol and those means. So coffee just became a really good conduit for those conversations and connections. Just a quick word from one of our sponsors and we'll be right back to the show. This episode is brought to you by the Koala International Education News website. You know, for years I struggled to find a dedicated news website about Australian international ed. And so I stayed up to date with the news that was most relevant to me as someone working in Australian international ed from a site and a newsletter called Campus Morning Mail. But then something terrible happened. The journalist who created Campus Morning Mail, well, he retired. And I was cast adrift in this ocean of unspecific news sites that lacked the insider knowledge of how Australian higher education and international education really operate, which is when something magical happened. An email arrived in my inbox from Dirk Mulder. If you don't know him, Dirk is a former director of international. He's worked at several Australian universities. And as fate would happen, he was also the lead international education correspondent for Campus Morning Mail. You got it. And Dirk let me know that he was launching the koala. I must say, I breathed a giant sigh of relief. So if you want current news and expert insider analysis on everything Australian international education, the koala news is your go-to site. Best of all, subscribing is easy and free, and you can have all of the most important going-ons delivered right to your inbox. No random, irrelevant information from far-flung corners of the world, just the nuts and bolts of what's going on in your industry. All delivered with a hint of humour and the knowledge of a long-time industry leader, which is Dirk. Visit thekoalanews.com today. That's thekoalanews.com in order to ensure that you're always across our industry's top stories. Earlier in our conversation, you'd, you'd said, God, I don't even know how many countries I've been to now. Mm. Where is the where's the best place, your favourite mm. place? If I could give you a magic plane ticket back to anywhere, directly out of out of your hometown, where, where would you go to tomorrow? I think I'd go back to Japan. For the sentimentality, I actually haven't been back for a while. And I feel actually, I feel like I'm still the commissioner for Southeast Asia, that I couldn't pick one country in Southeast Asia because the commissioner has to you know, love and, and support them all. But yeah, no, I'd, I'd go back to Japan. And I'd love to take my, my kids and my granddaughter now as well 
back to. And what about places you haven't been? If you had a mm. magical golden plane ticket and could go anywhere new, no cost, yeah. you know, including flying into Antarctica or anywhere, where, where would you go yeah. to yeah. as your first stop? So I have to admit to this audience, I have never been to Latin America. It goes back to those early days of where I needed, you know, kind of short trips. I could be up and back. And I had a few opportunities, but I've never been either for work or for personal reasons. And interesting, though, I've had actually quite a lot to do with Latin American trade programs, with students, with marketing and engagement. So I think, yeah, to, to get get there and obviously, you know, places like Machu Picchu and, you know, amazing places, but also just to be in in a mega city of Rio and just experience it. While I'm still young, while I'm still relatively young, we've still we've all still got heaps of time <laughs> you know, to go and do those things, aren't they? I mean, it's great when you start. I've just seen recently some people in my network, you know, well into their seventies, going doing some fairly adventurous stuff. And I was like, well, that gives me a lot of hope. There's still plenty yeah. of time left to go and do this stuff. Yeah, yeah. A little, little bit of a left a left turn on on the work stuff. What do you think are some of the most interesting things going on? Mm-hmm. out there in the world today that might impact international ed in some way. I know you and I recently were having a conversation about AI, yep. but, but what else is, you know, t- high in your mind? I think I'll come back to AI, but I'll start with, I'll start with talent first and foremost. Like the world has a talent problem in that we don't have the right people in the right place at the right time to do the work or to deliver the outcomes that we need. And so I think in Australia, it's about to look like in October when the migration review is released, there'll be a big focus on what are the caps, what are the measures, what are the changes, and we'll get very myopic in that. And it will affect a lot of providers. But more broadly, I think there's an opportunity to think about global talent and how we how we become the best magnet, the best home for that. And we don't have the right settings for that at the moment. So I think that's, and that's, that's a change. And I can say that having been in Southeast Asia as well, given the, actually the quality of talent there, but also we're not the first choice and we're not necessarily uh, providing the right pathway for, for that talent to come and, and engage. So that's my first T. The second one the, is technology. And I think in technology, it is, you know, we can't have a conversation without talking about AI or more specifically generative AI. But I think as we're seeing in lots of discourse at the moment, we're kind of either we're on the the spectrum of AI is good and it's going to solve everything or AI is bad and we, you know, we won't be able to regulate and we won't be able to survive. And I think the opportunity is now for more nuanced conversations around how we're going to actually achieve the, the aspirations or the benefits that we want from generative AI versus how we're going to regulate it. And I haven't read it yet, but I saw that UNESCO just just released something this morning on AI governance and policy. And if I put my government hat back on, I kind of go to governance first and foremost, because actually we've been using AI for a long time and, you know, maybe haven't even realised it or haven't called it out in that way. So there's a lot that is already working. The, the question now is around governance and how do we make sure that it works for us, not not against us. And in international ed, we've been using AI a lot. I mean, there's a bigger question in terms of education, pedagogy and, and, and learning and learners and how do you protect from plagiarism or, or other other forms of, of cheating in the classroom. But on the whole, I think for international education, we've benefited from advancements in AI and I hope that we can continue to, to invest in them. Right now, I am looking looking for a job. I'm job seeking. And I would say it's really changing. It goes back to my first point around talent as well. It's really changing the way um, you recruit. It's changing the way you need to prepare for um, for recruitment or be seen in, in recruitment. And I hadn't really thought much about that until I started this process now. And it's um, if anyone is thinking of a transition or um, looking for something new, I would really brush up on AI in in recruitment and make sure you're prepared and using the the tools for for your benefit. Just to clarify, when you're talking about um, you, you underestimated how important it would be. You, do you mean in terms of using it to prepare resumes and the like, or simply in terms of interest of employers 
and organisations in where it's heading? Yeah, both. I didn't realise how embedded it is in organisations in terms of even where you don't see it or think it's being assessed by AI tools. It is, but also how quickly that that can move. And then also as an individual, yeah, how quickly you can you can pull together a cover letter if you need to, obviously making sure that you you don't just send the the standard AI output, but it's really interesting to see what comes up if you task chat GPT to summarize you based on what they see online or summarize you compared to others. There's some really great tips on that. And Renata Bernardi is doing some great work. She's a, a coach in this space. She's doing some really interesting work on this. Yeah, awesome. So now you mentioned three T's. We've got talent technology. And was transition the third one or was there something else? It has been in this conversation, but in other work that I'm doing, it's actually about transformation and industry transformation. We've always been talking about we don't know what the jobs of the future are and we're going to have seven jobs. But literally now we do not know because we do not know what renewable energy is going to be the main source. We do not know how we're going to solve how we move hydrogen on ships. We do not know if it's going to be electrical vehicles or hydrogen. So the, literally the, the jobs don't exist yet because the, the transformation, the industry transformation hasn't, hasn't been complete. So I think that is going to shape a lot of what's happening for international education as well because new industries and, and are going to need skills and they're going to need them faster than ever, they're going to need smart people to collaborate with education providers to deliver those and design those. And I think they're going to change faster than we ever we ever have seen in our lifetimes in terms of the, the turnover of the curriculum and the, the outputs that industry wants. You've just mentioned speed there in, in numerous different forms. Do you think we're moving fast enough? And when I say we, that, that might be us as individuals in our learning. It might be us as institutions and as an industry in international education or us as a country, are we moving fast enough? Probably not. <laughs> but, but I know it feels like we are. I, when we're in it, I know it feels like we are, but I think we have way too many legacy systems and also some structural challenges that mean even though one part might be moving very fast, we're not, we're not connecting that up to see the greater outcome. I think at the... Yeah, national, state, local, individual business, it's patchy to say say the best. How can we move faster, do you think? Where's, mm. where's, is there an unlock there? Is that something that you've thought about? Like something that you've seen given you, you really have got this diversity yeah. of experience across, you know, the government and yeah. educational institutions, private sector, consulting. Yeah. Is there an unlock there where you're like, oh, actually one of the easy, easy low-hanging fruits would be this. Yeah, I wish it was that easy. And if I did have the unlock, then maybe I would have the next business idea that I'd be setting up. No, I, I do think it's a little bit boring, but it does come back to how we develop policy and how we involve all of the actors in policy making. And I think what we've seen in government and governments over the past 12 months, some of the the corruption issues, some of the issues with working with big four consulting groups. We've actually lost the art of good policy making and it's boring uh, to those who aren't in, in it, but when you get it right, it really makes all the difference. So I am seeing definitely a new conversation around public sector capability, but also around policy making. So I, I think that's a place that you have to start is to get that right. What I've seen in Southeast Asia is a very different relationship between tech and government. So, and, and in some ways leapfrogging what we achieve here because tech and government are working very closely together to solve problems. Now, I'm not sure we could actually do that here in Australia, but it'll be interesting to see in Southeast Asia how those, those partnerships solve policy problems and problems that government would normally deliver but are being delivered by a major tech company on behalf of government. And I use an example, uh, Bukalapak, which is one of Indonesia's biggest uh, tech companies, a tech unicorn. They basically do, they're an all-commerce provider for Indonesia, but one of the things they do for government and with government is actually basically deliver services and remittances through the, the small, you know, mum and pop stalls across Indonesia. 
and they make it possible for small business to thrive, but also, and I think this accelerated during COVID, they became almost a delivery arm for government to get information services and money out to to people. So it's a really interesting prospect. And I think tech in Southeast Asia, and we've just had the the Nicholas Moore Southeast Asia Economic Strategy 2040 released. And there's a whole chapter on education, which we can talk about another time. But Bukala Park as a company is one of the the examples in 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 that strategy as well. And happens to come, the founder is an alum from Melbourne University. So there's a connection there as well in terms of that alumni engagement and reinvestment back in Australia as well. It's funny that you just mentioned that strategy because I've literally just got that open on my mm-hmm. on my web browser in the background. Have you had a chance to read any any initial thoughts? I mean, Nick, Nicholas Moore, former CEO, Macquarie Bank, yes. I believe, or maybe chairman of C, Macquarie Bank. So very well-connected and influential business leader. Yep. But yeah, initial thoughts? Initial thoughts, and maybe it goes back to my earlier comment about the quick solve. I mean, we, we underestimate how important good consultation is in developing strategy and policy. And I think first and foremost, he did a great job in engaging across the region, engaging with, in my case, states and territories, but with education providers, business, banks, super funds, and of course, with with government. He was commissioned by the Australian government to do that. So I think that was great. Timing-wise, got to launch it at the ASEAN Summit in in Jakarta just a few days ago, and also announced the next uh, Australia ASEAN Special Summit that will take place in March next year in Melbourne. So again, in terms of in, in international relations, that signalling and that symbolism of announcing that, doing that work, announcing it there. And now I haven't got through all of the recommendations. I think I'm up to number 55 um, and that takes me through to Chapter 7 on the education chapter. I think there's some great opportunities there. One of the clearest ones is actually calling out the opportunity for increased transnational delivery and in-country delivery in Southeast Asia. So very clear on that, building on the existing networks. But it also does talk about and call out the blockages for the system, which we've spoken about migration as as one of those areas, but also mutual recognition of qualifications. We've been talking about this for a long time. If we were to really unlock the value, uh, if we were really to be open to talent from the region, mutual recognition will be a big part of that. And I hope that we can we can go hard up, double down on that in the next couple of years to, to unlock those. Engineers Australia, for example, is one of the first that I've seen that's made some commitments around mutual recognition, I think, directly. I'm not sure if it was all of ASEAN or in Indonesia, but I expect that you'll see more on that in the coming years. It does strike me as one of those areas which, where maybe that is low-hanging fruit because, of course, like a doctor needs to know what exactly what they're doing, but there is a certain degree of snobism yeah. in in across society as a whole yeah. that, that nobody can possibly do it exactly the, as well as we do or the same yeah. way, whereas really that's just creating creating barriers that perhaps don't need to be there Correct. and good policy. I think there's this, going back to social justice too, there's a sense of equity and fairness as well. So it's not to say that we would blindly accept a, any qualification. It's about how do you recognise the skills and the competency already there and then how do you teach for or fill the gaps. And that's a very different proposition. So yeah, you have just given me my quick win. Mutual recognition. Let's really move on that. That would be awesome. Let's tie a couple of things together. What you could do is actually use AI, which is very good at pattern recognition, to go and do a lot of that manual heavy lifting of comparing degree programs and everything and identifying those gaps from a very dispassionate uh, point of view. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Done. Solved. Hey, you know what? Since we've just solved a, a huge problem of of the nation, Rebecca, it might be a good place for us to wrap up. It's so so good to you know, sort of connect and have this conversation. And, and I'm fascinated to see what you do next as somebody, you know, who's done so much for our sector in international education and kicked so many goals. I'm sure it's going to be fabulous. So watching with great interest, and thanks for joining me today. On Thank you very much. My pleasure. Today's episode of the Global Horizons podcast was recorded on Garrigal land in Sydney. We love this place and we're so fortunate for the amazing job the Indigenous traditional owners have done to maintain this land over time. We pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. And if you've enjoyed this conversation on Global Horizons, make sure you subscribe. 
This is your spot for all of international education stories, news, and career advice. So please hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you in the next episode. I'm Rob Malik. Thanks for your company. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com.au.